Yeah. Okay. Let's do this. Today, we finish Exodus. Chapter 35 And Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together, and said unto them, These are the words which the Lord hath commanded, that ye should do them. That ye should do them. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be to you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. Correct. Have to be killed if you work on Sunday. Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. And Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it, an offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram's skins dyed red and badger's skins and shittim wood and oil for the light and spices for anointing oil and for the sweet incense and onyx stones, and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate. And every wise man hearted among you shall come and make all that the Lord hath commanded, the tabernacle, his tent, and his covering, his tashes, and his boards, his bars, his pillars, and his sockets. Don't forget the sockets, the ark, and the staves thereof, with the mercy seat, and the veil of the covering, the table, and his staves, and all his vessels, and the shoe bread, the candlestick also for the light, and his furniture, and his lamps, with the oil for the light, and the incense altar, and his staves, wow, they're really going through all of it, and the anointing oil, and the sweet incense, and the hanging for the door at the entering in of the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering, with his brazen grate, his staves, and all his vessels, the laver, and his foot. The hanging is of the court, his pillars and their sockets, and the hanging for the door of the court, the pins of the tabernacle and the pins of the court, and their cords, the cloths of service, not the clothes, the cloths of service to do service in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron, the priest. Okay, so last time Aaron helped cook up a nice golden bowl for them, and he's still the priest? Interesting and the garments of his sons, to minister in the priest's office. And all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. And they came, every one whose heart stirred him up, and every one whom his spirit made willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, and for all his service, and for the holy garments. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing-hearted, and brought bracelets, and earrings, and rings, and tables, all jewels of gold. And every man that offered, offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. And every man with whom was found blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine linen, and goat's hair, and red skins of rams, and badger skins, brought them. Every one that did offer an offering of silver and brass brought the Lord's offering. And every man with whom was found shittim wood, Shittim wood, for any of work of the service, brought it. And all the women that were wise-hearted did spin with their hands and brought that which they had spun, both of blue and of purple and of scarlet and of fine linen. And all the women whose heart stirred them up in wisdom spun goat's hair. And the rulers brought onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate. The breastplate of judgment! and spice, and oil for the light, and for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense. The children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord, every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work, which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of Moses. And Moses said unto the children of Israel, See, the Lord hath called by name Bezalel, 
the son of Uri, or Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and he hath filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, and to devise curious works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass, and in the cutting of stones to set them, and in carving of wood to make any manner of cunning work. So he's like a blacksmith, this Bezalel guy. And he hath put in his heart that he may teach both he and Aholiab, Aholiab, the son of Ahis, Ahizamach, of the tribe of Dan. Great, them hath he filled with wisdom of heart to work all manner of work, of the engraver and of the cunning workman, and of the embroiderer, in blue and in purple, in scarlet and in fine linen, and of the weaver, even of them that do any work, and of those that devise cunning work. And that is the end of chapter 35. A reminder about the Sabbath, talking about people making things that we've already described in detail, in great detail, up to this point. Chapter 35, 35 verses. That's it. Such a strange book. Or maybe stranger today. No, the head trip, what's going through my mind every time I read the Bible, I guess what makes it interesting every single time is that I'm thinking, there was an Englishman in the 1600s reading this same verse, even the same words. There was a Sephardic Jew reading the Hebrew of this in the 1100s. And sometime a long time ago, somebody wrote down these words in some language. And all of them were thinking generally the same thing which I'm reading right now. Someone decided that only exactly these 35 verses fit into this 35th chapter. Actually, the division into chapters is specifically attributed to Stephen Langton in 1205. But you know what I mean. Chapter 36. Then wrought Bezalel and Aholiab, and every wise-hearted man in whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding to know how to work all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary, according to all that the Lord had commanded. Wow, what a sentence. Just the arrangement of words in that sentence. I could not have done this if I haven't been reading the Bible up to this point. Well done, me. Verse 2. And Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab, and every wise-hearted man in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, even every one whose heart stirred him up, to come unto the work to do it. And they received of Moses all the offering which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of the sanctuary, to make it withal. And they brought yet unto him free offerings every morning. That's a lot of offerings. And all the wise men that wrought all the work of the sanctuary came every man from his work which they made. And they spake unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. And Moses gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing nice. For the stuff they had was sufficient for all the work to make it, and too much. And every wise-hearted man among them that wrought the work of the tabernacle made, page turn, ten curtains of fine twisted linen, and blue and purple and scarlet with cherubims of cunning work made he them. So, I've known this is coming. What follows is not exactly an interpretation on what we've already read about the tabernacle. Yes, it is indeed the exact same instructions that we just read in the previous episodes about the construction of the tabernacle and the creation of the Holy of Holies and the drape and the Ark of the Covenant, all of it is going to happen again. There's a few reasons why. Chief among them, because God had requested it so. Specifically, the first one was the command given to Moses. 
orally. You know what I mean, orally. And now the second, this that I'm about to read, is them actually doing it. Now, why is it important that they actually write it? I do not know, but there's a lot of guesswork. Some of the more convincing ideas that I've read online are that it was necessary historically. Moses, if he is the author of this book, indeed wanted to write down every single detail. Sort of like when you do something and you're really proud of it and you're like, I did this and I put the shit him wood in the gold tash next to the sockets. Let's not forget sockets. So Moses wanted to specifically say what they did to for posterity to because he was proud of it. But uh, lastly, and the most interesting reason, because the people of Israel just fucked up. They turned to idolatry. And now by repeating the same work, word for word, in the Bible, we get a sense of exactly the kind of work that was being done. It feels like work of atonement. That's the interpretation that I like the most. But it seems to be any one or all of these. So if you're ready, I'm ready. Let's send this off. With the b b b b b Okay, verse 9. The length of one curtain was twenty and eight cubits. Ugh. Ah, that stings. Okay, and the breadth of one curtain, four cubits. Ah! The curtains were all of one size. More. And he coupled the five curtains, one unto another. And the other five curtains, he coupled one unto another. Five on five. And he made loops of blue on the edge of one curtain from the selvage in the coupling. Likewise, he made in the uttermost side of another curtain in the coupling of the second. Fifty loops made he in one curtain. And fifty loops made he in the edge of the curtain which was in the coupling of the second. You see how this works. The loops are over each other. The loops held, held one curtain to another. It makes sense. And he made fifty tashes of gold and coupled the curtains one unto another with the tashes, so it became one tabernacle. What I'm starting to see here is it's made of gold, the most exquisite linens. It, this makes sense as a portable temple. It can't make something as grand as an actual temple, so they're trying to make the best version that they could possibly have of that DIY style on the go as aesthetically pleasing as it can be made so it's like well it would have to be a tent so we can close it up and then keep moving and then set it up somewhere else but all the pins are gold (laughs) all right verse 14 and he made curtains of goat's hair for the tent over the tabernacle 11 curtains he made them the length of one curtain was 30 cubits and four cubits was the breadth of one curtain The eleven curtains were of one size, and he coupled five curtains by themselves and six curtains by themselves, and he made fifty loops upon the uttermost edge of the curtain in the coupling, and fifty loops made he upon the edge of the curtain which coupleth the second, and he made fifty tashes of brass to couple the tent together, that it might be one, and he made a covering for the tent of ram's skins, dyed red, and a covering of badger's skins above that. And he made boards for the tabernacle of Shittim wood, standing up. The length of a board was ten cubits, and the breadth of a board one cubit and a half. One board had two tenons, equally distant from one another. Thus did he make for all the boards of the tabernacle. And he made boards for the tabernacle, twenty boards for the south side, southward, and forty sockets of silver made he under the twenty boards two sockets under one board for his two tenons, and two sockets under another board for his two tenons. And for the other side of the tabernacle, which is toward the north corner, he made twenty boards, and there forty sockets of silver, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. And for the sides of the tabernacle westward, he made six boards, and two boards made he for one of the corners of the tabernacle in the two sides. And they were coupled under 
They were coupled beneath and coupled together at the head thereof to one ring. Thus he did to both of them in both of the corners. And there were eight boards and their sockets were 16 sockets of silver under every board, two sockets. And he made bars of shittim wood, five for the boards of the one side of the tabernacle and five bars for the boards of the other side of the tabernacle and five bars for the boards of the tabernacle for the sides westward. And he made the middle bar to shoot through the boards from the one end to the other. And he overlaid the boards with gold and made their rings of gold to be places for the bars and overlaid the bars with gold. And he made a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen. With cherubims made he it of cunning work. (sighs) Okay. I need a break. All right, let's go. Verse 36. And he made thereunto four pillars of shittim wood and overlaid them with gold. Their hooks were of gold. And he cast for them four sockets of silver. And he made an hanging for the tabernacle door of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen of needlework and the five pillars of it with their hooks. And he overlaid their chapiters with and their fillets with gold, but their five sockets were of brass. Chapter 37, the ark. And Bezalel made the ark out of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half was the length of it and a cubit and a half the breadth of it, and a cubit and a half the height of it. And he overlaid it with pure gold within and without, and made a crown of gold to it round about. And he cast for it four rings of gold to be set by the four corners of it, even two rings upon the one side of it, and two rings upon the other side of it. And he made staves of shittim wood, and overlaid them with gold. And he put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, to bear the ark. And he made the mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half was the length thereof, and one cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And he made two cherubims of gold, beaten out of one piece made he them, on the two ends of the mercy seat. That's cool, beaten out of one piece. So the two cherubs are one piece of gold. That's cool. (laughs) I gotta take what I can get, guys. One cherub on the end, on this side, and another cherub on the other end, on that side. This side and that side. They get really specific and then really vague. Um, Out of the mercy seat made he the cherubims on the two ends thereof. I don't know if I mentioned mercy seat. It's the lid. It's the lid on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And the cherubim spread out their wings on high and covered with their wings over the mercy seat, with their faces one to another, even to the mercy seatward, were the faces of the cherubims. Okay, I couldn't help it. The Greek word for mercy seat in Hebrews 9.5 is helasterion, which means that which makes expiation or propitiation. Expiation, the act of making amends or reparation for guilt or wrongdoing, atonement. Or propitiation, the act of propitiating or appeasing a god, spirit, or person. Or atonement, especially that of Jesus Christ. The mercy seat or lid cover was what was being sprinkled with blood during the rite of the sacrifice. Additionally, it was above the mercy seat between the wings of the cherubim that God was said to appear to the priests in the Holy of Holies. Of course, this isn't cherubim like the little babies that we think of today that are more like Roman cupids. These were much, much worse. According to the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament, the cherubim has two pairs of wings and four faces, that of a lion, an ox, a human, and an eagle. Their legs were straight, the soles of their feet were like the hooves of a bull, and they gleamed like polished brass. Now imagine that in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Verse 10, And he made the table of shittim wood, Two cubits was the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof. And guess the height. You want to know how many cubits? And a cubit and a half the height thereof. Yes. And he overlaid it with pure gold. 
and made thereunto a crown of gold round about. Also he made thereunto a border of an handbreadth round about, and made a crown of gold for the border thereof round about. And he cast for it four rings of gold, and put the rings upon the four corners that were in the four feet thereof. Over against the border were the rings, the places for the staves to bear the table. And he made the staves of shittim wood, and overlaid them with gold to bear the table. And he made the vessels which were upon the table, his dishes, and his spoons, and his bowls, and his covers to cover withal, of pure gold. And he made the candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work made he the candlestick. His shaft and his branch, his bowls, his knops, and his flowers were of the same. Fucking gold! And six branches going out of the sides thereof, three branches of the candlestick out of the one side thereof, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side thereof. Three bowls made after the fashion of almonds in one branch, a knop and a flower and three bowls made like almonds in another branch, a knop and a flower, so throughout the six branches going out of the candlestick. And in the candlestick were four bowls made like almonds, his knops and his flowers, and a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same, according to the six branches going out of it. So we're being what we're getting is a description of the menorah, right? And then there's a knop under each. It's like segmented each branch. Anyway, their knops and their branches were of the same. All of it was one beaten work of pure gold. And he made his seven lamps and his snuffers and his snuff dishes of pure gold. Of a talent of pure gold made he it and all the vessels thereof. And he made the incense altar of shittim wood. The length of it was a cubit, and the breadth of it a cubit. It was foursquare, and two cubits was the height of it. The horns thereof were of the same. And he overlaid it with pure gold. Oh, this is the altar of incense, by the way. Both the top of it and the sides thereof round about, and the horns of it. Also he made unto it a crown of gold round about. And he made two rings of gold for it, under the crown thereof, by the two corners of it, upon the two sides thereof, to be places for the staves to bear it withal. And he made the staves of shittim wood, and overlaid them with gold. And he made the holy anointing oil, and the pure incense of sweet spices, according to the work of the apothecary. Chapter 38 The Altar of Burnt Offering And he made the altar of burnt offering of shittim wood. Five cubits was the length thereof, and five cubits the breadth thereof. It was four square, and three cubits the height thereof. And he made the horns thereof on the four corners of it. The horns thereof were of the same, and he overlaid it with brass. And he made all the vessels of the altar, the pots and the shovels, and the basins and the flesh hooks and the fire pans, all the vessels thereof made he of brass. And he made for the altar a brazen grate of network under the compass thereof beneath unto the midst of it. And he cast four rings for the four ends of the grate of brass to be places for the staves. Everything is made to be portable. So you can stick staves into these rings and then carry these things. And he made the staves of shittim wood and overlaid them with brass. And he put the staves into the rings on the sides of the altar to bear it withal. He made the altar hollow with boards and he made the laver of brass and the foot of it of brass, of the looking glasses of the women assembling, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So the altar of the burnt offering, that's outside of the tent. It's within the tabernacle, like the compound, (laughs) but that's not in the inner sanctum where there's the menorah and the showbread and Ark of the Covenant. So the reason for this is obviously because they're burning offerings on it. It has to be outside. There isn't a tent over it. And then for that reason, everything is made of brass instead of gold. But that's twofold. One, if it's brass, they can burn things on it and it's fine. Gold would probably melt. But also, 
the inner sanctum is much more precious and holy, so gold it is. Verse 9, the court. And he made the court. On the south side southward, the hangings of the court were of fine twined linen, an hundred cubits. Their pillars were twenty, and their brazen sockets twenty. The hooks of the pillars and their fillets were of silver. And for the north side, the hangings were an hundred cubits. Their pillars were twenty, and their sockets of brass twenty. The hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver. And for the west side were hangings of fifty cubits, their pillars ten, and their sockets ten. The hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver. And for the east side, eastward, fifty cubits. The hangings on the one side of the gate were fifteen cubits, their pillars three, and their sockets three. And for the other side of the court gate, on this hand and that hand, were hangings of fifteen cubits, their pillars three, and their sockets three. All the hangings of the court round about were of fine twined linen, and the sockets for the pillars were of brass, the hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver, and the overlaying of their chapiters of silver, and all the pillars of the court were filleted with silver. And the hanging for the gate of the court was needlework, of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen. And twenty cubits was the length, and the height in the breadth was five cubits, answerable to the hangings of the court. And their pillars were four, and their sockets of brass four, their hooks of silver, and the overlaying of their chapiters, and their fillets of silver. I'm feeling a little sag here. Let's tighten up, guys. And all the pins of the tabernacle and of the court round about were of brass. The people's offering. This is the sum of the tabernacle, even of the tabernacle of testimony, as it was counted according to the commandment of Moses for the service of the Levites by the hand of Ithamar, son to Aaron, the priest, and Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, made all that the Lord commanded Moses. And with him was Aholiab, son of Ahizamach, of the tribe of Dan, an engraver and a cunning workman, and an embroiderer in blue and in purple and in scarlet and fine linen. All the gold that was occupied for the work in all the work of the holy place, even the gold of the offering, was twenty and nine talents, and seven hundred and thirty shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. And the silver of them that were numbered of the congregation was an hundred talents and a thousand seven hundred and three score and fifteen shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. Okay, so let's do some math. That's a thousand seven hundred three score is sixty and fifteen seventy five. So one thousand seven hundred seventy five shekels. That's a lot of shekels. A becca for every man. That is half a shekel, after the shekel of the sanctuary, for every one that went to be numbered, from twenty years old and upward, for six hundred thousand and three thousand and five hundred and fifty men. And of the hundred talents of silver were cast the sockets of the sanctuary, and the sockets of the veil, and hundred sockets of the hundred talents, a talent for a socket. And of the thousand seven hundred seventy and five shekels, He made hooks for the pillars and overlaid their chapiters and filleted them. I like that there's at least this accountability. Like, listen, we used every one of those for sockets, this many sockets per shekel and half shekel per adult, about 20 and older. We're not doing nothing with this money, guys. And the brass of the offering was 70 talents and 2,400 shekels. And therewith he made the sockets to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the brazen altar, and the brazen grate for it, and all the vessels of the altar, and the sockets of the court roundabout, and the sockets of the court gate, and all the pins of the tabernacle, and all the pins of the court roundabout. Chapter 39. The Cloths of Service and Holy Garments. That is cloths, not clothes. Don't need that E. The cloths. And of the blue and purple and scarlet, they made cloths of service, 
to do service in the holy place, and made the holy garments for Aaron, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he made the ephod of gold. All right, back to the ephod. Let's go. Blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen. And they did beat the gold into thin plates and cut it into wires to work it in the blue and in the purple and in the scarlet and in the fine linen with cunning work. Wow, nice. They made shoulder pieces for it to couple it together. By the two edges was it coupled together. And the curious girdle of his ephod, they keep talking about this curious girdle. I don't know what's so curious about it. That was upon it was of the same according to the work thereof, of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet and fine twined linen, as the Lord commanded Moses. And they wrought onyx stones enclosed in ouches. This is the old English word for a cavity or a socket in which gems were set. And they wrought onyx stones enclosed in ouches of gold, graven as signets are graven with the names of the children of Israel. And he put them on the shoulders of the ephod that they should be stones for a memorial to the children of Israel, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he made the breastplate of cunning work, like the work of the ephod. Another uh, definition of the word cunning I've seen translated to like artistry. So he made the breastplate of artistic work, like the work of the ephod, of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet and fine twined linen. It was foursquare. They made the breastplate double. A span was the length thereof, and a span the breadth thereof being doubled. They set in it four rows of stones. The first row was a sardius, a topaz, and a carbuncle. This was the first row. And the second row, an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row, a ligure, a ligure an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a barrel, an onyx, and a jasper. They were enclosed in ouches of gold in their enclosings. And the stones were according to the names of the children of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, every one with his name, according to the twelve tribes. And they made upon the breastplate chains at the ends of wreathen work of pure gold. And they made two ouches of gold, and two gold rings, and put the two rings into the two ends of the breastplate. Makes sense. And they put the two wreathen chains of gold into the two rings on the ends of the breastplate, and the two ends of the two wreathen chains they fastened in the two ouches, and put them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod before it. This guy's like, listen, I'm really proud of the... (laughs) We're going to put every word of this. We're going to do it twice. We're going to do it live! Say it all again. I don't care. And they made two other golden rings and put them on the two sides of the ephod underneath toward the fore part of it. Ah, the Uman Uman and Thurman, the Uma Thurman are coming up toward the fore part of it over against the other coupling thereof above the curious girdle of the ephod. And they did bind the breastplate by his rings unto the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue, that it might be above the curious girdle of the ephod, and that the breastplate might not be loosed from the ephod, as the Lord commanded Moses. Okay, let's get the curious girdle part out of the way. So it seems this isn't a girdle the way we would think about it. It's more of a belt. New King James translates this as the intricately woven band of the ephod, and NIV, the skillfully woven band. This is taken from the Hebrew word, which means a girdle, a band, or a truly ingenious work. Why the curious bit? Why so curious? I've done a little bit of poking around, and I'm not finding any clear answers yet, so I will endeavor to answer this another day. Verse 22, And he made the robe of the ephod of woven work, all of blue. And there was an hole in the midst of the robe, as the whole of a an habergian with a band round about the hole that it should not rend. Okay, so habergian or habergian <laughs> sounds like fake Swedish um, <laughs> is a historical word meaning a sleeveless coat of mail or scale armor. So the ephod is made like a habergian. 
with a band round about the hole that it should not rend. And they made upon the hems of the robe pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet and twined linen. And they made bells of pure gold and put the bells between the pomegranates upon the hem of the robe round about between the pomegranates. A bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate round about the hem of the robe to minister in as the Lord commanded Moses. And they made coats of fine linen of woven work for Aaron and for his sons, and a mitre of fine linen, and goodly bonnets of fine linen, and linen breeches of fine twined linen, and a girdle of fine twined linen, and blue and purple and scarlet of needlework, as the Lord commanded Moses. And they made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold, and wrote upon it a writing, like to the engravings of a signet, in all caps, HOLINESS TO THE LORD. And they tied unto it a lace of blue to fasten it on high upon the mitre, so on his hat, way up on his hat, a gold engraving which says HOLINESS TO THE LORD, as the Lord commanded Moses. Thus was all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation finished at last. And the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so did they. And they brought the tabernacle unto Moses, the tent and all his furniture, his tashes, his boards, his bars, and his pillars, and his sockets. I love these pronouns. The tabernacle. He's a good, he's a good guy. You ever hung out with the tabernacle? Dude, he's got pillars and sockets. He's all right. And the covering of ram's skin. I'm sorry. And the covering of ram's skins dyed red, and the covering of badger's skins, and the veil of the covering, the ark of the testimony, and the staves thereof, and the mercy seat, the table, and all the vessels thereof, and the shoe bread, the pure candlestick with the lamps thereof, even with the lamps to be set in order, and all the vessels thereof, and the oil for light, and the golden altar, and the anointing oil, and the sweet incense, and the hanging for the tabernacle door, the brazen altar, and his grate of brass, his staves, and all his vessels, the laver, and his foot, the hangings of the court, his pillars, and his sockets, and the hanging for the court gate, his cords, and his pins, and all the vessels of the service of the tabernacle for the tent of the congregation, the cloths of service to do service in the holy place, and the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and his son's garments to minister in the priest's office. According to all, that the Lord commanded Moses. So the children of Israel made all the work. (sighs) And Moses did look upon all the work, and behold, they had done it, as the Lord had commanded. Even so had they done it, and Moses blessed them. All right. Chapter 40. The erection of the tabernacle with its anointing is commanded. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Page turn. On the first day of the first month shalt thou set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. Uh, The tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. The tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. The tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. It's a lot of syllables. And thou shalt put therein the ark of the testimony, and cover the ark with the veil. And thou shalt bring in the table, and set it in order the things that are to be set in order upon it. (laughs) In the order of the order that it is. And thou shalt bring in the candlestick and light the lamps thereof. And thou shalt set the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of the testimony and put the hanging of the door to the tabernacle. And thou shalt set the altar of the burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. And thou shalt set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar. And shalt put water therein. And thou shalt set up the court round about, and hang up the hanging at the court gate. And thou shalt take the anointing oil, and anoint the tabernacle, and all that is therein, and shalt hallow it, and all the vessels thereof, and it shall be holy. And thou shalt anoint the altar of the burnt offering, and all his vessels, and sanctify the altar, and it shall be an altar most holy. And thou shalt anoint the laver and his foot and sanctify it. 
And thou shalt bring Aaron and his sons unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and wash them with water. And thou shalt put upon Aaron the holy garments, and anoint him and sanctify him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt bring his sons and clothe them with coats, and thou shalt anoint them as thou didst anoint their father, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office, for their anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. Thus did Moses, according to all that the Lord commanded him, so did he. And it came to pass in the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tabernacle was reared up. Finally. (laughs) Now it's reared up. Okay, I thought they were, I guess they were just done making all of it. Now they've done it. And Moses reared up the tabernacle and fastened his sockets and set up the boards thereof and put in the bars thereof and reared up his pillars. And he spread abroad the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent above upon it as the Lord commanded Moses. And he took and put the testimony into the ark and set the staves on the ark and put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the veil of the covering and covered the ark of the testimony as the Lord commanded Moses. And he put the table in the tent of the congregation upon the side of the tabernacle northward without the veil. And he set the bread in order upon it before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. And he put the candlestick in the tent of the congregation over against the table on the side of the tabernacle southward. And he lighted the lamps before the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he put the golden altar in the tent of the congregation before the veil. And he burnt sweet incense thereon, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he set up the hanging at the door of the tabernacle. And he put the altar of burnt offerings by the door of the tabernacle. Is he doing all this by himself? I know he's not, but... That would be funny if he was just, (laughs) everybody makes it and then he just personally puts up everything. And he put the altar of burnt offerings by the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation and offered upon it the burnt offering and the meat offering as the Lord commanded Moses. And he set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar and put water there to wash with all. And Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet thereat. When they went into the tent of the congregation, and when they came near unto the altar, they washed, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar, and set up the hanging of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. I don't know how blasphemous it is, but I gotta say, I feel like I finished some work too, just reading all of this. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Ah, we're in it now. Finally, and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation, because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went outward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. That's the end of Exodus. Well, throughout all their journeys, huh? What a journey. Thinking about the beginning of Exodus to the end. Very different. Clearly different authors. I mean, we have a beginning focused on the mythological origins of Moses. It's a story. It's very engaging. And then by the end, we've completely flipped all of this on its head. And this has turned into a literal instruction manual in how exactly to the exact detail and measurement create a portable temple, which the Jews use to praise God as they continue their journey to the promised land. What to make of all of this? The Exodus ends when the tabernacle, or their temporary temple, is erected. 
and not a moment sooner. If you remember back when they were in Egypt, one of the primary contentions that Moses had was, let my people go so that we can go and worship our Lord. Only now, at the end, do they have the ability and the exact guidelines and instructions and in how exactly to do that. So this is where the Exodus ends. They've come home to their home away from home on their way back home for the first time for the last time. Well, not the last time. As we've seen and as we will see, it's going to take a few tries to get the Jews to stay in the Holy Land. Speaking of, it took a few times for them to even get on the right path, on the way to getting to the promised land. Not only do we have new laws, organizational structures being set up, even building the tabernacle, all of these things are hard to do. But in the midst of this, they have to fight against the sin that always comes up. The people don't believe Moses is coming back, or they're just getting antsy. Hell, at the beginning of the journey, they're like, we're just angry because we're hungry. So hunger, sin, (laughs) dancing around, worshiping bull gods because Moses took too long on top of the mountain. All of these things can creep up at any time. It's like they're becoming the true people of God by a thread (laughs) with a lot of, please give me another chance. Please, please give me another chance. For God's chosen people, they don't act, they are not perfect. In fact, they're led by one of the least perfect, Moses. Slow of tongue, slow of mind, as he says. Although at the same time, we've seen how when he was needed, there was no slowness in thought or tongue. When he said, please don't kill everybody, I know you can do it, give them one more chance. He does it. He becomes the God of the people, so to speak. When God gives the people of Israel forgiveness, Moses has to punish him in his own way. This was one of those next steps as we get closer and closer to the idea of the perfect society that God is trying to create. It also involves a strong hand. God reflects down through Moses, and Moses is the one who punishes the people so that they can live. Actually, this confusion between who is truly the God of the people, I think, comes to the fore at the end of these books of Moses. But for now, that's enough to keep me happy. The cloud of God and the burning fiery pillar of God is hanging out by the tent. All, at least for now, seems to be well. And that's where I will leave you at the end of the second book of Moses. Thank you for listening. Next time, we jump into Leviticus. Fare thee well, my creeping things. Adios.